Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal. I'm here today in the beautiful downtown stores area in uh, Connecticut. And I'm here today to check out a very fascinating thing I never expected to find in a random town in uh, Connecticut that just happens to be where my uh, father-in-law grew up. And that is the Ballard Institute of Puppetry. There's a puppet museum in downtown stores. Uh, it sticks out right here in the main area. And that's because the Uni University of Connecticut or UConn actually has the US's only graduate program in puppetry, yes there is such a thing, in the US and it's a world center of excellence in puppetry education. Not only that but they have a puppet museum as well in which they exhibit all kinds of fascinating puppets from different parts of the world and the guy who knows more about puppets than possibly anyone else in the US, possibly the world I'm going to say, is the director of the puppet museum, his name is John Bell. I've been corresponding with John for the past year, he's very kindly invited me today to come and check out at the fine puppetry museum here. We're gonna go inside in a second. We're gonna see a lot, a lot of different puppets. Find out, check their permanent ex ex exhibition as well as a temporary exhibition. I'm gonna tell John about my uh, weird interest as a 33 year old man in uh, stuffed animals, which I believe is a form of puppetry. And uh, let's go inside and learn everything about puppets. So thanks very much to John for making this possible. Hi, my name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry here at the University of Connecticut in beautiful stores, Connecticut, downtown stores. And we're at the Puppetry Museum. I'm standing in front of our permanent exhibition, which is called The World of Puppetry, because puppetry is really a global art form. And in this relatively small exhibit, we have puppets from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, from uh, Latin America, South America, and from the United States, which uh, is a, it's a large part of our collection. And we are very excited about puppetry because it's a global art form that every culture pretty much has um, deep connections to. And puppets, these material objects that we use in order to communicate with other people for entertainment or ritual or for political ideas are kind of ubiquitous, even though sometimes they seem invisible in today's media world. But uh, we're the only uh, university in the United States that has a puppet museum and a uh, puppet arts program, which we're very proud of. It's over 60 years old, the puppet arts program. And we're happy uh, that we play such a large role in puppetry in the United States and, and around the world. Do you want me to talk more about this, or do you want to go into? Um, the... Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit about this. You know, I'll edit out some some sections. Just kind of keep. So, in the world of puppetry exhibition, we like to let people know that wherever they come from, there's probably some really interesting and highly developed art form of puppetry from their culture. So we have like rod puppets from Indonesia right here. This is a shadow puppet from Andhra Pradesh in India. These are hand puppets from Taiwan. Chinese shadow figure, Javanese shadow figure, Vietnamese water puppets, which are really unique because they're, as you can see in the photo, they're performed in the water. Then uh, this is a, a marionette of the Hindu god Ganesh, who has an elephant kind of head, from Nepal in the Himalayas. And our Af small African section includes this rod puppet from Mali and this boat full of uh, passengers and people rowing, uh, also from Mali, used in ritual performances, which are really very exciting. Shadow puppets from Egypt, uh, big shadow puppet traditions in the Middle East and in China and in India. Then on our rapid tour of the world, these are European puppets, which might be a little bit more familiar to those connected with European culture. A marionette or rod marionette from Sicily, hand puppets from France and England and Germany and Poland. Uh, part of those traditions. These from uh, socialist, communist Poland. These from uh, Germany from the early 20th century. And this guy over here is a character named Guignol, 
who's a very popular French character. From Latin America, we have a multi-horned mask, which is termed a vejigante from Puerto Rico, part of the carnival traditions here, which connects uh, African tradition with European traditions and Taino indigenous traditions from Puerto Rico. This hand puppet, uh, a black hand puppet, is from Brazil from a tradition called Mamalengo, which also links uh, Afro-Caribbean traditions with indigenous Brazilian traditions and Portuguese European traditions. So already, just with that, you're looking at some super exciting aspects of cultural history. And then these uh, wooden, more two-dimensional figures um, are uh, from the Chingu River region of Brazil by the Calapalo people, so indigenous puppet work. This metal mask is from Mexico, part of the <coughs> very uh, robust and exciting mask and puppet culture of Mexico, which is next to the United States, but has its own amazing traditions and aesthetics and practices of mask and puppet theater. The rest of <coughs> The rest of the puppets here are from the US, from these from the 1930s, when there was a whole puppet renaissance, people saying, wow, you know what? Puppetry could be a new area of modern art and performance. Yes, so people like um, uh, Tony Sarg and uh, Lou Boonen and the um, Turnabout Theater all created puppets as an art form. They were very conscious of making art with puppets. You also had people like Marjorie Batchelder who made this rod puppet, combination rod puppet, shadow puppet. And you also have um, Basil Milovsarov with making this abstract puppet for a film of the Seven Voyages of Sinbad. Paul McFarlane, who was kind of a grandfather of American puppetry, our own Frank Ballard, who founded the Puppet Arts Program at the university and also is the namesake of the Ballard Institute, made this marionette of the Queen of the Night for Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute. And then we have some uh, puppets by Ale Lou Curtin, a sort of a hippie in leather. Fr um, the, this puppet right here uh, is uh, Let's see, um, this puppet right here is by Jim Henson. We have a couple of Jim Henson puppets. This was for a television show that never came to light because he started doing Sesame Street instead. Puppet by a Yukon grad named Paul, uh, Brad Williams. Charles Ludlum, who was a proponent of what we call queer theater, so a sort of gay approach to theater, but he also did puppets and was also a ventriloquist and then a, what we call a direct manipulation puppet, two versions of that by Janie Geyser, who currently teaches at California Institute of the Arts. So that's a pretty small exhibit, but it shows the wide array of, of work that characterizes puppet theater here in the US and around the world. We just opened a new exhibition called Swing Into Action, Maurice Sendak, and the world of puppetry. And that exhibit, which uh, is in these two galleries, we created with the help of the Maurice Sendak Foundation. Maurice Sendak was not a puppeteer, but he was a graphic artist, a visual artist, very interested in essential stories, as it were. He was the son of Jewish immigrants from Poland, lived in Brooklyn grew up in the 1930s during the Depression. And as you can see in these uh, drawings that he made in the 1950s and, the, and in the 1970s, uh, he was very interested in gesture and movement and body. So he started to make, like this is a drawing of puppets or a drawing of, of Commedia dell'arte masks. He loved the work of uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, his favorite composer, and just wanted to tell stories about Mozart. Like a lot of two-dimensional artists, sort of uh, um, similar to Sendak, are intrigued by the idea of making their art move. So sometimes that turns into animation, like the work of Walt Disney, 
and sometimes that really easily shifts into puppetry. So uh, Sendak was interested in 19th century animation. Uh, like he made these um, little automata over here with his brother Jack when they were uh, in, living in Brooklyn in 1948, and they tried to sell them to FAO Schwartz, which was a famous toy store in, in New York, so that the, the, that company would build these automata. That didn't happen, that FAO Schwartz didn't buy them, but Sendak got a job doing window displays for FAO Schwartz, which is another way of sort of getting in sideways into puppetry. He also liked toy theater, a 19th century flat cutout tabletop puppet form, and the work of a German graphic designer named Lothar Megendorfer, who also was interested in how two-dimensional images can move. So you have a mechanical figure there showing a man picking flowers. There's another uh, transformation image of a man riding a horse. And then you pull a tab, and it shows the man having fallen off the horse. You also have a toy that um, uh, is operated by sand falling through one chamber into another. And when that happens, a little mouse uh, connected to an organ grinder does acrobatic flips. In the 19th century, people were really interested in how objects move, how images move and how technology can make that happen. So one whole aspect of that was the development of film. You get a bunch of photographic images and you show them one after the other and you get uh, film. So that was one invention that came out of this time and some of these other inventions came out of that time too, some less successful than film. But Sendak was really interested in that. He was also interested in Mickey Mouse. He identified with Mickey Mouse and the golden age of animation in the 1930s. So he collected a lot of objects related to his various interests in 19th century art, and in this case, Mickey Mouse. So here's a, a Mickey Mouse mask uh, that he collected, a Mickey Mouse doll, a Mickey Mouse uh, sort of climbing character, a self-portrait of himself as Mickey Mouse that he made for TV Guide magazine in uh, 1978. And on the other wall here, a, uh, an animation cell from Walt Disney's Pinocchio. You know, another form of uh, making the graphic arts combine with movement, right? Super interesting for him. Here he is, a photograph of him with one of the oversized masks for the opera version of Where the Wild Things Are, his kind of his famous children's book that put him on the map. Here we have some more uh, aspects of two-dimensional graphic design that come out from the page and move. So you have Lothar Megendorfer's International Circus, which has like these acrobats and clowns. Um, it's like a pop-up book as you can see in the shape of a circus ring that he was intrigued with, a, a pop-up book that Sendak himself designed called Mommy, in which a little boy uh, goes into a house looking for his mother and all he finds are these classic monsters like the Wolfman and Dracula, uh, but he's not phased by any of that. Beautiful uh, pop-up book design by um, Matthew Reinhardt, who's a pop-up book uh, technician. And then he collected uh, something called Scrappy's Animated Puppet Theater, again from the 1930s, based on a very popular cartoon animation series about a character named Scrappy. And it was a little puppet theater that you cut out of paper and you could do it yourself at home. In the 1980s especially, Sendak became interested in theater design, set design, costume design, and uh, one of the things he did was uh, Hansel and Gretel, which is an opera by a composer named Engelbert Humperdinck. And the house, the, the witch's house he made for Hansel and Gretel has um, animated eyes that move. This is the model, the set model for it. Uh, 
the, the middle part of the house turns around and becomes an oven. The, the windows open and close with little skulls behind them. So this is a type of set design where the set itself becomes a kind of puppet character. After the success of Where the Wild Things Are especially, and, and Sendak became quite famous, he started a kind of second career as a set and costume designer for opera and ballet. And especially with the operas, he was able to uh, develop work that um, involved his favorite composer, Mozart. He loved Mozart. He loved to listen to Mozart while he drew sketches. They were called fantasy sketches because he'd listen to a piece of music and whatever he felt like drawing, whatever the music inspired, he would write down on the paper. So he had the chance to do a whole number of, of um, productions, operas and ballets, including uh, this comic ballet, Comedy on the Bridge, which is uh, written by a Czech composer. And it's actually a pretty serious story about two couples who meet on a bridge during a war, and the countries on either side of the bridges are at war with each other, and they have all these conflicts. And Sendak designed these fish to, to swim under the bridge. So you get this typical Sendak combination of kind of delight and color and uh, humor, as it were, but also these very serious contexts about war and personal relationships. This uh, mask that he designed was part of his uh, work for The Love for, for Three Oranges, which is a, an opera uh, designed or written by um, uh, Prokofiev and based on a Commedia dell'arte scenario. And because it was based on Commedia, you have these Commedia masks, which he liked. But he also designed, like, the cook, uh, a combination cook and kitchen, a puppet that has the head of a cook but the arms of these spoons, and all the different parts of the kitchen come together in one giant puppet. This show, The Love for Three Oranges, also allowed him to make a giant inflatable puppet for the female, the villainess of the piece. Over here, we have the, um, the armature for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade version of Moisha, which was a character from Where the Wild Things Are. It's actually kind of a self-portrait of Sandak, his self-portrait as a demon. So. He was intrigued by the possibility of making an inflatable puppet. He said, yes, of course. And so the Macy's Thanksgiving Day uh, Parade shop in New Jersey was you know, going to build the puppet according to the needs of inflatable puppet design. But Sendak was deeply involved. He loved collaborating with people on all of these projects. And we have video footage of him going to New Jersey, and there's, a, there's clay on this armature. And he says, well, the eye should be this way, and he gets his fingers in the clay and starts designing. So he loved that possibility of doing a giant puppet based on his work. Another giant puppet he made was for another, for a Mozart opera, a comic opera, The Goose of Cairo, that was um, first done in 1985. Uh, in, in um, a double bill with a, an opera version of Where the Wild Things Are. And it's kind of a goofy story about uh, a man who fall, a guy who falls in love with a girl and the girl's father has her locked up in a castle. So he decides in order to get to the, his beloved to have a giant goose, kind of like the Trojan horse, that he would give to the father, but he's inside the goose. And, you know, as you can imagine, it turns out happily ever after. But this is the goose for this Mozart opera. Um, the, this is his first sketch for it. And you can see at the top, there's a little uh, headdress that says Wolfgang Mozart there. And the name of the opera, Loca del Cairo, the goose of Cairo. Uh, he just loved 
the idea of Mozart's work being animated. Here's a, a model for the goose of Cairo that bends, the wings flap up and down, the head moves. And then here's the giant goose itself, which uh, also is very uh, interestingly complicated. It has animatronic eyes, the mouth opens and closes, the neck moves. It, you, it's on a cart, and when you pull the wheels of the cart, the legs, the feet move up and down. So I love the way that there's so much joy in such a goofy thing as this giant goose. And you can sort of see how Sendak is appreciating what opera makes possible on, on the stage. The, let's see, the first puppet version of Where the Wild Things Are was done in 1976 by an American puppeteer based in Italy. Her name was Amy Luckenbach, and um, she's uh, no longer living, but she got a copy of Where the Wild Things Are in a London bookshop and read it to her children, and she's like, wow, I got to do a puppet show about this. So she did. And so she, you can see here all the characters she made with colleagues in Italy. They're very nicely done. People in the U.S. don't really know about Amy Luckenbach's puppetry. But um, you can see here a photograph of a performance of the show in a little piazza in Florence, Italy, with her son narrating and uh, the backdrops and the puppets from the show. She later met Maurice Sendak, who came to a book fair in Italy, and he was totally excited about her work. And they began a friendship and collaboration that lasted through um, her death in the early 2000s. She did a, what we call a direct manipulation version of Where the Wild Things Are, different from a hand puppet version, uh, with Sendak's approval in 2005. And this is Max from Where the Wild Things Are <coughs> as a direct manipulation puppet. And you can see um, in these photographs of the production done with Syracuse University and a theater in, in Florence, how two puppeteers uh, directly manipulate the puppet here with the moon, uh, as you can see in the background, or here uh, after the wild things fall asleep and Max is the king of the wild things. It's another form of puppetry that, that's quite versatile, direct manipulation puppetry. These puppets, probably people might know them, from the film Where the Wild Things Are, directed by Spike Jones and uh, released by Warner Brothers. So a number of different film companies wanted to do a, a film version of Where the Wild Things Are because, you know, it, it's such a popular book and it kind of lends itself to animation and, and you know, colorful treatment. So um, finally, uh, the director, Spike Jones was brought into the production, and Sendak said, I think this guy, Spike Jones, he really would do a good job with where the wild things are. The puppets were designed by Sonny Gerasimovich, together with Jim Henson's Creature Shop. And you can see here, there's very fine detail in these two puppets. Um, on the left, Alexander with the horns here, and then Max in the middle, and on the right, Douglas, who's kind of a a bird, as you can see. So you're, the, this is definitely the world of puppetry. You know, these are oversized masks and costumes, but it's that world of communicating through objects, you know, masks, costumes, props, you know, rather than just unadorned actors themselves. Though the show over here is another collaboration that Sendak did uh, with Amy Luckenbach, and here's a photograph of Sendak and his friend, the playwright Tony Kushner, who wrote Angels in America, and Amy in her studio in Florence, Italy. Sendak sent her some of these fantasy sketches, these sketches that he drew while listening to Mozart, and which he peopled with characters uh, from his own imagination and also from uh, uh, the history of Mozart. 
the show is called Fantasy, Ske Fantasy Sketches and Life of Mozart. And this section here is the fantasy sketches. And the, one of the sketches in our exhibition shows the story of this little boy who um, gets eaten by this, uh, this bird, or it's actually a fish, excuse me. Uh, he flies away. Uh, at first there's a bird involved, then a fish. He gets eaten by the fish, comes back home. The fish spits him out. The mother's really happy to see him. And so he, he uh, engorges, he, he eats the mother. You know, this is a very Sendak kind of absurdist action, right? Which is kind of serious and disturbing, but also goofy. With Sendak, there's this mixture of kind of serious content and sort of psychological stuff going on, but also delight, you know, which I think makes a book like Where the Wild Things Are so popular, you know. It's a little boy who, does, who, who, who doesn't do the right thing, you know, and wants to get away from home, you know, and ends up back at home after his adventures with the wild things. This, uh, these puppets here from a, another one of the sketches about a, um, a woman with a lo long neck and a mirror, and this, uh, uh, this monster over here, this, uh, the roaring beast, ends up eating the long-necked girl. Another situation where uh, one character gets eaten by another. The music was Mozart, played on a piano forte, and then two sort of glass harmonicas. So you get Mozart, you get the fantasy sketches, you get puppetry. This collaboration with uh, Amy Luckenbach and uh, Tony Kushner and the musicians, you can tell he loved those collaborations. This young Mozart series from the same show uh, also based on his fantasy sketches, shows sort of the life of Mozart. Mozart is, is a little baby with his um, sister, Nan Earl. Mozart is a young boy here with um, Joseph Haydn, the great composer, who was Mozart's friend, and they're dancing together. So Sendak loves this idea that the two composers, Mozart as a boy and Haydn as a, an adult, are dancing together. Then here a piano where Mozart would write his music and Mozart uh, as a young man with his dog Bimperl. Sendak himself loved dogs and always had a dog and dogs very often appear in his work, in his sketches and in his books. And up here on the wall you have you know this glorious the music of Mozart and some angels flying around, you know, um, celebrating the work of Mozart. So, although Mozart, excuse me, although although Sendak was not a puppeteer, he really, like many visual artists and performers and musicians, he really appreciated what puppets can do, and really appreciated those opportunities opportunities he had to be involved in the world of puppetry whether it was building little automata with his brother Jack, or collecting uh, material performance images from the 19th century, uh, in working with and engaging with Amy Luckenbach, who was a puppeteer making shows out of his work, or later on designing uh, the sets and costumes for operas and ballets, which already always have one foot into the world of, of puppets and masks and performing objects. So we're super excited about this exhibition. It's the first exhibition ever of uh, Sendak as uh, someone related to the world of puppetry. And we're really happy that it's the first time that the work of Amy Luckenbach can be uh, presented in the U.S. Uh, John, so firstly, thank you for that amazing tour sure. of the Puppet Museum. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, I mean, I think few people who've come through stores know that this is one of, you said this is the only graduate program in America for puppetry. You offer uh, certificates in the college and the university, as well as uh, a minor, bachelor's, yeah. and master's. So can you tell me a little bit about who 
come through these programs, what kind of jobs they'd be aiming for? Well, we get a whole range of different students and uh, after they graduate uh, from the program, they do a variety of different things. People, you know, some of our more famous students work in, uh, as puppeteers on Sesame Street or uh, in, in film, the film industry, in the New York theater world. There's a very vibrant puppet, puppetry community in New York City, but also in, in every city uh, around the country, Chicago, um, Boston, uh, everywhere you'll see uh, graduates from the puppet arts program doing work. Some people do more building and design for shows like Saturday Night Live or other films. Other people do more performing and writing. Some people uh, create their own puppet theater groups, like this summer we're featuring a number of puppeteers, a lot of them puppet arts graduates who have their own companies and will be performing here on the town square. So it's a whole variety of different things that puppeteers can do. I think in part because as puppeteers we have a lot of different skills. You know, we, we design, we build, we perform, we write shows, we you know, we do movement, we often play music, we're, we're schlepping stuff all the time. So it's, uh, uh, there's a whole variety of different types of work that we can do. I think one, you know, not coming from, I told you that my, I became acquainted with stories through my father-in-law who grew up here as a house, yeah. and it's a very interesting place, but kind of not where one might expect a puppetry, you know, not, not just, I guess, a national, but a continental center of excellence to be based. Yeah. The only thing I really know about Yukon is it started out, if I'm not mistaken, very much involved in agriculture. Yeah. So how does puppetry come into their perspectives? Right. Yeah, it's a land-grant university uh, here in Connecticut. Frank Ballard uh, was hired in the 1950s to teach uh, set design at the, in the uh, dramatic arts department here at Yukon. But he grew up in Illinois, Alton, Illinois, in the 30s uh, at a time when there was a renaissance in puppetry across the country and especially in Illinois and Chicago. And people were saying, hey, you know what? We could invent puppets to be this art form for the 20th century. And not just for kids, but to do you know, operas and serious drama and Shakespeare. So it's, it's the beginnings of kind of where we are now with puppetry, where people, puppeteers anyway, are seeing it as an art form for everyone in a, in a variety of different uh, ways that it can be performed. So Frank Ballard grew up doing, you know, dozens and dozens of puppet shows by the time he was in, in middle school. And although he became a set designer, he always had puppetry in mind. And after he got hired here at UConn, he started a puppet class. And it was very popular. Mm. And uh, in part because of his personality, his ability to draw people in and say, let's do this giant production of a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. And people would say, wow, yeah, let's do it. So uh, after the first class he offered, the, um, the popularity of that uh, led him to develop a what's now the Puppet Arts Program. That's now headed by my colleague Bart Rocco Burton, and it's been going for over 50 years. And uh, the Puppet Arts Program has a, a, a center on the depot campus, which is a couple of miles from here, with mm -hmm. beautiful uh, facilities. The Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry started in the 1990s as a way to preserve a lot of the many puppets that Frank Ballard and his students created for his various productions, as well as puppets that Ballard and others collected and accumulated. So uh, it, the Ballard Institute started with a group of volunteers who began to create exhibitions highlighting Ballard's puppets and other puppets from the US and around the world. And we're continuing that work here uh, in store center with a variety of different exhibitions like the um, Swing Into Action, Maurice Sendak and the World of Puppetry exhibit, mm -hmm. and the World of Puppetry, our permanent exhibition. We have other exhibitions, uh, usually on a four-month rotation, 
that bring in puppetry from around the world. So it's, it's exciting for me as a puppeteer to share the richness of the form with our audiences here and then sometimes farther afield online or through the internet. Sure. It's a global form that's played uh, important roles in all the countries in which it's arisen over many centuries. And to think about what it's done in the past, what puppetry is doing right now in a variety of different forms, and what it could do in the future, it's, it's just super interesting. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned that uh, one of the main uses for puppetry nowadays would be in you know, special effects in Hollywood. So yeah. do you see that as that technology, as post-production SFX becomes progressively more, um, is there still going to be a continued role for physical, physical puppetry? How is that going to play out in the industry? Yeah, it's really interesting. Well, for us that when, in puppetry studies, when we think about these forms of performance that use the material world rather than just person-to-person -person communication, all of these different forms are related and they learn from each other. I think of the Star Wars movies for a while, they started to use more um, digital effects, mm -hmm. but then at a certain point, I think in the last few films, they said, you know what, we were much better off much more effective when we did analog special effects, you right. know, masks and puppets and oversized Interesting, costumes. so there's been a, almost a reverse evolution of sorts. I think so, yeah, and I think that's super interesting because there's something about the actual presence of this material sculpted or created thing that you're moving around to perform that's in, in connection with, um, or, or working together with actors is really dynamic, is really convincing. And right. So I, I think there will always be a, a place for actual puppets and masks and performing objects despite the advances in digital technology. Because they, they create that atmosphere for the actors that you just can't get when you're working in front of a green screen or whatever. I think so, yeah. yeah. I mean the digital stuff is going to be with us a long time and kids now grow up gaming or you know they they play games and they become a, they have an avatar or they become in a way a puppet character in the world of the game and mm. you operate this character who's not you who's this you know two dimensional or maybe there's an illusion of three dimensions this digital character this digital puppet you know so people are engaging with the form in all levels of society mm. i think yeah, you mentioned something very interesting when we were chatting before this, the tour, which is that, you know, we conceive of the, if you ask someone on the street, what's a puppet, they'd say, you know, it's, yep. a, it's a little toy. But you said that kind of anything that creates a, in, the, in the sense of storytelling some distance between you and your audience, that's a form of puppetry. So I had to quickly introduce to my YouTube channel. This is my own puppet. This is a this is a teddy bear, yep. and I'm a 33 year old man, and I I, I love these things. So tell me, sure. what is it about uh, people like me that are drawn to acting out their emotions, feelings using inanimate objects, even even as they mature into adulthood? What what's the kind of appeal for someone who gets into puppetry and becomes a puppeteer? That's a really good question, and I think it's something that's uh, been part of culture and civilization for many many centuries. You know, with um, ritual objects, fetish objects, religious objects, you know, from Christianity to Hinduism and all sorts of other forms of other belief systems. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is what um, the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud called in modern terms the uncanny. This uh, feeling that an op like an object that's dead might be alive, right? Mm. And the possibility of that, you know, like you have your your teddy bear Zaf. there. <laughs> What's his name? He, he, his name's Cornelius. But he's Cornelius, Zaf, you know, Zaf, right? Right, Cornelius. Like, well, who is this? Per who right. is this thing? I I, I give the kind of personalities. We had it growing up. My sister and I had a koala teddy bear. So I think it's part of for yeah. me as a creative. I really sort of it's some. I mean, maybe it's partially escapism, but it also just kind of channels you really channel your expression through these, through these objects. You, you enter into a, an, an illusion, you know, if we're together with Cornelius, you know, mm -hmm. we're both sort of saying, okay, let's assume Cornelius is actually 
a being, you know, right, right, they, right. with a, ca a name and a personality and character attributes and a physical presence, you know, what could that be? It's really intriguing and there's all sorts of ways with, in puppet performance where you, it's like, wait a minute, it's, you know, is that alive or is it dead? And if it's alive, who yeah, is that? There, there, there's that moment of... I think about like suspended disbelief, right? Yeah. Where you're kind of, you just get so yeah. drawn in. I think like what you guys are doing with the public performances. That's actually one more question. And I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm very curious about, you know, uh, UConn, how people outside of the arts programs in the college, the local residents even, uh, how, you know, you, you guys are surely doing, a, you're, a, you're raising awareness of puppetry. What kind of a vibe do you get from people who, I've never thought much about it from encountering your displays and education. I think once they come in, you know, people walk by without coming in a good bit because I think a lot of people think, oh, I don't have anything to do with puppetry. Right. But once you come in, you, you realize, oh, okay, this is really interesting. Or maybe, you know, you're from Korea and you see a puppet from Korea or you're from China or from Latin America and you realize, oh, there are these traditions from uh, that country that I'm connected with that are very strong. Or you see something, you know, like where the wild things are. Maybe sure. you saw the film of that, you read the book. Um, or like we have a lot of students working with us and one, one young man is an engineering student. Well, in this exhibition of Sendak's work, there a lot of his stuff he was interested in is combinations of engineering and graphic design. You know, so engineering is a part of puppetry. We have another student who's studying sociology and early education. Well, puppetry has long been a part of education, and sociologically, it's you know a very important part of the way societies operate. Mm -hmm. So there's many different ways to enter into the world of puppetry, and right. I think our job is to sort of let people know, oh, well, if you're interested in that, there's actually a connection to puppetry right yeah, there. Yeah, it's pretty, I guess when you think about it, so puppets are objects of entertainment, you said they have a role in religious ceremony, yep. and even you mentioned education, right, as yep. didactic uh, tools, so, yep. right, when you, so you, you've got me thinking more about puppets in the last hours than I have done probably in the foregoing. 33 years of my life, but that's amazing. Uh, John, I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. I've been bugging you by email for two years. I'm super glad Good. we finally uh, got to meet up. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, your your uh, huge knowledge of puppetry with, uh, with me and my YouTube channel. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. So that was it, guys. Lots and lots of information about puppets there. Uh, very, very big thanks to John Bell uh, for facilitating this. If you are interested in learning more about uh, puppetry, this is definitely one of the places to check it out. They do performances in Store Center. They're doing one uh, this coming Saturday, the previous Saturday and the one before. Uh, check out the museum, check out their website. It's all online, absolutely fascinating stuff. And it's got me thinking about what puppetry means. Hope this video was enjoyable, interesting, informative. And if you'd like to get more videos from me about puppets, technology, and all other forms of uh, interest, then uh, please subscribe to the channel.